So it's framed as really a story of African agency in the modern world, the modern multipolar world. Okay. President Museveni, for those who don't know, he's been in power in Uganda since 1986. He was heralded as a new breed of African leader who's going to do things differently. But he's, uh, he even publicly stated the problem with Africa was that leaders stay too long in power and he wasn't going to feel like that. I'm kind of a sadly classic good man gone bad kind of thing. He now seems to be grooming his son to be his successor as maybe the next development. Uganda is democratic. Eh? People who don't know the context, they do have elections, but uh, you know, it's hard to beat him to the uh, ballot box, yeah? Um, he's also not really delivered transformative growth, okay? Uganda's not talked about it, maybe the way Ethiopia has been, or maybe how Rwanda has been. From all that. So he's been there a long time, I would argue, without, you know, really transforming uh, Uganda uh, in a meaningful sense. But, also, it's wrong. He's been a skilled manipulator. He's balanced Western security interests, uh, extremely well and has, has kept the West on board. Um, uh, he's been very important to regional integration. Okay, You can be cynical and say he wants to be the king of East Africa. Possibly that's true, but he has been central to regional driving, pushing for regional integration within the East African community. Uh, and I was interested in him, interested in regional security in this new era of this rising China and there was a period 2010s really where China really seemed to be steamrolling into Africa, getting all the resources, building all the roads, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's interesting in how Museveni is now operating at a time when Africa is kind of trying to reform its security arrangements with its region economic communities and the African piece of security architecture within this rising um, uh, rising China. Okay. And uh, so the issue of insecurity, how and why does China's engagement in Africa impact regional security and what's the role of African leaders uh, within that was my area of interest. Especially as really, Museveni has never, never wanted to be over-reliant on any foreign powers. As most of interview quotes have got no interest in benefactors that control them. Yeah, he's always wanted to be independent even though he's perceived as a Western ally as such, okay? Um, so it was a case study of the East African community, which is the regional or sub-regional organization. In a particular era, really, 2010, 26, there was the coalition of the willing, where um, Uganda, Rwanda, and Kenya really started pushing forward on integration. And controversially, it didn't really um, include Burundi and Tanzania through the other areas of the group. There was big publicity, big excitement, big controversy uh, that they were pushing for roads, pushing for rails, really wanting to push ahead and forget if these other countries don't want to be involved, then let's forget them, okay? And these were big projects, big money, big ideas, and China was relevant throughout. So I um, focused on that particular era, okay? The key um, arguments really of the book are that the 70 is an African leader has displayed geopolitical agency against China and regional neighbors by utilizing the presence of the Chinese. China, yes, is more powerful, but the 70s skill and foresight has ensured China's investment in Uganda has helped maintain his rule domestically and with as with the China EAC engagement has been utilized by Museveni to push his regional agenda as well. So I use this term that China has become an unwitting accomplice in aiding Museveni's machinations. They haven't favored him deliberately or actively, but he's used their presence in order to strengthen uh, position himself. Okay? Um, I will talk about the book in terms of how my contributions, rather than just going through it chapter by chapter, although the book is similar to this, but not quite, I want to focus on what I hope are my kind of vaguely interesting contributions, uh, which is the role of China regionally, China's regional impact, or sub-regional impact in Africa, China's security impacts, how they influence the security dynamics, and then African leaders, specifically the Seventies role within those uh, dynamics and relationships. I'll briefly also, if I have time, discuss things I didn't, I missed from the book, either 
because of time, or just the time has moved on a bit since so I'll just back on those things. I'm not sure um, <coughs> will speak about as well. Okay, so China's regional uh, relationship uh, with China. There's this nice quote, I always put this in. China is all over Africa, yes? And it's a nice quote from a Ugandan uh, security specialist. The Chinese have systematically and carefully done it. If the president is sleeping in a state house, staring at the ceiling built by Chinese, he will think twice before he acts against them. That's huge influence. The whole thing is to capture the psyche of the higher political thinking of African leaders and make them think or look at China as an alternative friendly power. They have really become ingrained in the African political economy in a way they have, they just simply weren't 30 years ago. There's a long history, by the way, of China-Africa relations, and each region I'm going to discuss has a different history. I don't, in this presentation, I don't talk about that history. I do a bit in the book, but just for time. But really, this post-2000, post-2010, is really was a new era of China relations, okay? Clearly part of this rising China, okay? Um, so China, I... I agree with Chris Alden, who some of you might know, um, really that China in Africa wants markets to sell goods. Yes, it wants natural resources, which is the kind of stereotype, but it's true. And it wants UN votes, yes? Africa is a big block of votes. So it wants political allies in the geopolitical um, uh, space. And the emphasis on each has changed and is changing, but it's really those three things. Um, and it has successfully done that by offering cheap materials, building contracts at a reasonable rate. Okay, some of their pricing clearly suggests maybe the government in China has helped them do lower pricing. It takes risks. Chinese companies take risks that Western companies simply wouldn't take in terms of margins, but also the spaces they're willing to operate in, um, and respecting the local uh, people, especially local issues. There's controversy with local racism and mistreatment of workers, but really on the diplomatic <coughs> level, the respect at least seems genuine. They speak to and treat African leaders differently to how the West has done it, okay? Um, and that's genuine. And on the projects, they get their hands dirty, yes? The bosses of these big projects, they're on the ground doing the work and staying there as long as they need to, sleeping on site till they get the projects done. Yeah, they're not like people like me flying in first class and checking a project for two weeks and flying home, blah, 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 and making budgets for that. Yeah, so they have. They've, been, they've got into Africa in quite an impressive way. Uh, I'm going to be quick now, but I did see sub-regions, or I call them regions really in Africa, have slightly different security impacts or nuances of the Chinese experience, okay? I've just grouped them together for ease here, because I discussed them in the book separately. So, of course, West Africa is dominated by Nigeria being the biggest market. There's also Francophone influence there, which is different from some other places, um, the reappearance of coups especially. North Africa is very distinct. China really hasn't moved in in the same way and then they would displace the historical Western relationships and influence. Uh, there's a more of an Islamist uh, issue there that has affected the Chinese, especially um, example, okay? Um, Southern Africa, the Angola, people talk about the Angola model, which was really developed in Angola, the resources for infrastructure model. So they've been an important partner. Leaders have been crucial. Mugabe really became a bit of an embarrassing ally for um, China. Um, Dos Santos and Mbeki have, have, have influenced the relationship in other places. Uh, Central Africa, generally lots of confusion around big contracts in DRC and whether they're going to build things or not, etc., etc. I'm skipping over this bit as quick as I can today. Um, in the Horn, really, Sudan was China's entry point uh, into China in the modern era. Um, and again, interesting examples of Bashir in Sudan versus Meles in Ethiopia. But they're both the poster child for Bashir, that China supports tyrants, and they don't care if you're brutal or kill your population, so that supports that narrative. Meanwhile, Meles in Ethiopia is a kind of example of what could be done if you were effective, thoughtful, transformative leader, how you can use you know, um, Chinese presence to develop your country. Um, 
the East African community, I'll talk more about East Africa, really slightly more balanced geopolitical picture um, and big flagship projects, but I'll talk about that. But really my main point is that um, China's role in the regions, the, 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 big, the big projects, big rail, big projects, big dams have serious regional, sub-regional geopolitical repercussions where the road goes, where the rail goes, where the dam is, that affects the development and power within a region. Um, and uh, plus there's lo lower level uh, impacts as well. So the role of leaders have shaped, different leaders have really influenced the way China's perceived in different uh, regions. Um, they are the big projects, again, I call it developmental insecurity. <coughs> really, these projects theoretically are great, you know, building Ethiopia, Djibouti, railway line, um, maybe helps heal relations, as it were. And here's an example of Angola building a train line that really shifts um, access to gold mines, a particular set of gold mines away from South Africa towards a port in Angola that's also built by the Chinese. So it shifts sub-regional power relations within different contexts. Uh, and then they've had to adapt to different issues. There have been local protests against Chinese in different places. There's been regime overthrow, Arab Spring, which China dealt with quite well, actually, from their perspective. And then different local security threats, jihadi threats versus other things. So it really, um, China is sucked into whatever regional security dynamics already exist. And I think anyone interested in China-Africa relations, I'd encourage you to do case study work. We're always situated within the region, especially if you're interested in security. There's always a regional impact or influence that I think somehow sometimes gets missed from people's analysis. Okay. Um, I meant to set the time, which I didn't do. Um, okay. So looking at East Africa specifically now, which is my area of interest. Mm -hmm. So the structural context, which I've talked about, um, is similar to elsewhere. Um, uh, heavy investments within all of the East African countries, including a specific agreement with the regional organization, which is quite rare. Okay. And they appeared at the time when Leaders were already telling the West, we're fed up with you, okay? Um, I have this nice quote where the Chinese intervention has strengthened what we already have been telling the West. We are fed up of lectures. I remember this guy who always, always said, the West, they talk to us like we're stupid. We're not stupid, okay? Talk to us like human beings, okay? Which is what the Chinese did. And, they, and Uganda, and Museveni had been saying that publicly and privately to the West. Stop lecturing us. Okay? They were already feeling that, and then China appears at the time to fill that gap that was being searched for. Yeah. Um, and what do Chinese do? They come big, big delegations, big money on the table. Uh, you know, big people coming, speaking. You know, not just sending the little underlings. The bosses of the companies coming, etc. Yeah, they do things big. And they, they're serious and it made an impression, yeah? Um, so that's the structural context within East Africa, really, that China investing heavily and having an impact, okay? But what were the local security impacts, okay? And here, um, I, in my research, I really tried to be sincere and go to spaces and say, what are the security? What are you concerned about? And then looking for where China came in, rather than asking what's China doing here. What are your security issues? And then thinking about where China came in. And the big ones during this era that I was kept on being asked, uh, thought about was really terrorism and um, oil. Uganda discovered oil, or we discovered it kind of in 2006, and slowly threatening to produce it. They've been very slow and various delays, but there was big talk at the time that Uganda has oil. Okay, so um, uh, let me go back to my slide. So where does China come in? Okay, <coughs> terrorism. It doesn't support rebel groups. Okay, I'm not saying that or arguing that. But lots of the small arms and light weapons. The reality is they come from China in three ways. Historically, okay, lots of the guns in the region are left over from that anti-colonial struggle. 
that China arm, I'm not, can't even blame China necessarily for that, but lots of the guns have been there for decades and they came from China. Uh, they trade with governments, they sell governments guns in Sudan, they even built an arms factory for Ashia in Sudan to build guns, okay? China doesn't have armed rebel group, um, groups, but Bashir did, and lots of them, and other governments, they sell arms, clearly some of those are arms end up in other places, okay? Um, and the other thing is, lots of these guns uh, go missing. There are local soldiers just steal them, or policemen, sometimes it's just someone who's it's run to sell so their gun for money, sometimes it's more organized, but anyway, there's lots of arms in the region, okay? The other big one for terrorism is ivory. Ivory trade has become deeply problematic in East Africa. Um, the elephants, I don't know if it's changed slightly, mm. you might tell me, but people were worried that we're not going to have any elephants left in East Africa. The poaching has become so bad. It's not Chinese doing the poaching, okay? But China's a big market for this stuff, and there's clearly Chinese living in Africa who are along the supply chain. They're not the only market, but they're a big, big market. Okay, and it's big money. Ivory is, is big, big money. Yeah, it's worth oil money, diamond money, kind of levels. Okay, um, and clearly terrorist groups are involved in those supply chains. Al Shabaab, North Resistance Army, Allied Democratic Forces, etc. Okay, not necessarily driving it, but they're part of it. Um, and then oil, oil and gas. East Africa has become an oil and gas region. Um, and boy, well, I don't quite know why, in terms really, but it's, all these oil farms, they're just in the worst possible places you could possibly put oil. Okay? The or Ugandan oil is on the border between Uganda and the Congo. You know, if you want to start a war between the two countries, that's where you put the oil. Okay? In Kenya, it's in the most neglected regions, Tukana, and those kind of areas where there's already tension and marginalization seems to be where all this resources are being found, okay? And that's, of course, creating um, tension. Uh, and then the coalition of the willing, this, this group of three leaders who wanted to go away, go alone, clearly lots of the big projects are gonna be funded by resources, okay? Um, yes. Uh, final main point uh, before I do kind of things I missed, etc. Uh, is where, where's the 70 coming to this? Okay, so in Uganda, um, again, similar picture. Okay, Uganda was very open about saying we're going to get the Chinese to build our roads, build our rail, uh, build our dams because we can pay them oil money in 10 years' time, 50 years' time. So we're very open and explicit about that. The 70 went to parliament and said, I told the Chinese directly, I'm going to, they, they're going to get the contracts. Right, regardless of what Parliament is going to tell me. Okay, so that was very obvious. They flattered Museveni. He had big ideas. We're going to build a refinery in Uganda. I'm going to build the longest pipeline in the world to export the oil. And some oil companies are like, mm, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work. But the Chinese are like, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll help build it. It's fine. So Museveni rewarded them with some of the oil, early oil contracts, went to Chinese companies even though they were actually major entrants, right? Um, yeah, so they were kind of in, bit flattered, I think, by the Chinese, um, but did then was able to reward them. Um, China, except I wanted to, this as a side point, though, but in the local oil region in Uganda, they like the Chinese, I mean, the Chinese companies to get bad reputations. And why? Because they made a local football tournament for local people, Sinop Cup. Okay, because that's what local people cared about. Yeah, so they're clever, the Chinese company. They're not, they, they were the most popular um, company out of the three oil companies when I was there because they, they, they listened to the local people. What do you care about football? Let's do a football tournament. It's clever, right? Um, and doesn't get so much attention, I don't think. Um, where did Museveni's agency come in? At the domestic level, there's an idea of Mr. is a dictator, if you want to call it that, okay? But he's not a kind of just iron crab, click your finger and anything can happen. Uganda State Building is what they call an absence of hierarchy. Different pillars of state building, the judiciary, parliament, opposition, 
they have a role to play. Okay, the seventy has to balance that important rich businessman. Okay, he's in a circle. His cabinet ministers who also have power bases. So they have to be balanced. Okay, now he's managed to keep the most leverage and keep the most influence over those moving parts. Okay, um, uh, but he, he he has to balance them. He can't just coerce them all the time. Um, and China has played a role in all of these. Parliament, they invite all the MPs to go to China, stay in nice hotels, learn about the Chinese development model, etc. The 70 allows that. But when a Chinese company wanted to buy MPs' debts, okay, so they, they take, because MPs are in too much debt in Uganda and other places in Africa. A bank says, we'll buy your debt. Okay, then you owe us the money. The 70 blocks that and said, no, that's too much influence. You're not allowed to do that. Okay. Um, the army, they're increasingly training lots of Ugandans. <coughs> they're building army barracks. Interestingly, the Ugandan army is building lots of the big Chinese roads and railways. Um, they're involved in that. But he still maintained a diverse range of military partners. Okay, not becoming overly reliant on China. Um, in a network and shadow networks, okay? If you powerful businessmen and ministers, if you do a deal with the Chinese, they have to take a cut. You know, they have a front for the local business community. Okay? He has to balance those powers of letting people make deals. He has to allow particular ministers to take this deal, another minister to do that deal. If they get too rich, too powerful, he arrests them for corruption, uh, he sacks them. He leans on them in that way. Okay, so he's been very clever at allowing a certain amount of graft, but when it's not in his interest, he'll penalize you for that. Okay, and the Chinese contracts are big money, yeah. So clearly, those contracts, yeah. Um, regional influence, I'll talk about about, but really, historically, most le other leaders in East Africa, especially in this time, owe something to this area. There's some historical connection. They fought in the war together. He helped them in the peace process. There's something, okay, in some way. So he's been very clever with that. But this is a big, it's quite a long quote, okay. I'll let you kind of leave it. This was from a Chinese businessman working in Uganda. Okay, he's been there for 10 years. Um, it's explaining how, how, how the relationship works, okay. And what's strange is you see two different big Chinese companies competing for the same contract. Yeah, and they're even in courts together, fighting in Ugandan courts, arguing about who got the contract, etc. And really it's the local fronts who are arguing about who gets the deal. Okay, this big Karuma Dam, which was Uganda's biggest dam, etc. Um, it was those court cases, front page news, because one minister. I think it was the Ministry of Security or Ministry of Development or something, and the Foreign Ministry had signed different contracts for the same project. Okay, so there's big arguments. But when it gets serious, they have big long meetings. The 70 takes everyone to his retreat. They have big long meetings. They talk to the Chinese president as well, and they decide who's going to get the contract. It's really is how, it's how it's fixed. Okay, and he's been very clever at balancing those interests. Um, and of course, the Chinese government and business, they know, they know that's how it works. And that's the Ugandan context, yeah? it's not just Chinese doing that. But I had another quote um, I haven't used today, that the Chinese have taken like a fish to water in terms of how to do business with Uganda. <coughs> yeah? But the Chinese system is not so different from that, apparently. People can call me out on that, but uh, that's my understanding. Okay. Um, Final couple of points, uh, we hope. Um, at the regional level, um, have I done my slide? Yes, what does this role do? So the militarization of the security agenda, really. Lots of small arms and light weapons, a militarized response to the ivory trade, a kind of secret bit of a, people don't talk about it, but a bit of an arms race going on between Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania, etc. Really, all that the militarized conception of security clearly suits. The 70. That's his. That's his mindset. Yeah, and he's been able to position himself as centrally important to regional dynamics. Okay, and turns a blind eye to his military, you know, selling ivory on the side and that kind of thing. Right. Okay? 
and the political economy of development. He was very clever in the coalition of the willing era. Kenya wanted to build north, yeah, had this big Lapset project, building roads and rails to Ethiopia and Sudan and all that kind of stuff. And he said, no, 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 build, build coalition of the willing, let's keep it into East Africa. Join up to my oil refinery, we do the standard good railways, big across East Africa, we'll build a pipeline, etc. Lots of publicity. Kenya, the president of the time, came and spoke at the Ugandan parliament, which hadn't happened before, blah, 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 blah. And then he just shafted everyone. Two days later, he embarrassed the president and said, I'm going to build a pipeline to Tanzania. And by the way, we don't have any money to complete the standard good railway project, which Kenya had already built half of, of, and there was ultimately this failure to deliver. But for several years, he was very clever at making Uganda central to all of these big Chinese projects and these big regional plans. Okay. Um, ultimately, that whole thing fizzled out now. The professor will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think coalition of willing no one's really talking about anymore. But we'll talk about Q&A, yeah? Um, so overall conclusions will be Please, I don't know how long I've talked too long. A um, uh, couple of key points, okay. Uh, where have I put my notes for? Just bear with me. Yes, so his agency, it's important, okay. His role against terrorism in Somalia really matters. There's global implications, okay. Um, forget your ethics and what you think about him personally or his regime, but he provides an example to Africa of how China can be managed and resisted, um, even as they attempt to gain a dominant position. Um, and the developments in East Africa have unequivocally influenced, have been unequivocally influenced by Museveni's manipulation of China's engagement to improve his own domestic and regional position. Um, it's also time dependence, this agency. I looked at the, a particular time period, a moment in history, particular era in the region and of China, and there was a moment of opportunity, okay, where he seemed to assert influence and um, be a strong influencer, but that wasn't, it didn't lead to transformation, okay, that's unraveled, and that moment was missed, but it was there, yeah, it shows these moments of opportunity to um, materialize. Um, and also agency, his agency is limited, let me not overstate things. Uh, in the 70s, he doesn't just bend the region to his will. Of course, the China the Chinese are rich and powerful and influential. Other leaders in the region are influential. Um, uh, and he's been limited in his achievements. Okay? Tactically, in the short term, he's brilliant and very clever. But in terms of a long-term strategy of transformative development, he doesn't seem to have it. Yeah. Um, Overall, the rise of China shapes a global context in which great power thirsts for resources, markets, and allies, uh, and is able to lend billions of dollars for Africa for much needed projects. China has not penetrated East Africa by aligning itself with Uganda's interests against other actors, but Museveni, as a leader, has used China in this context to actively and deliberately forge a more coherent regional security and integration agenda, primarily designed to help maintain his domestic position. China found Museveni to be a master tactician, a master tactician capable of utilizing China as a ready means of influencing a regional environment yet to be fully negotiated and stabilized. Okay. Um, I'll be really very final slide, just things I didn't get a chance to think about. I wrote this book just COVID was only just starting, COVID era has changed things. There's Russia and Ukraine war, of course, has changed things. Bobby Wine, some of you might have heard of, is becoming increasingly well known, um, features very briefly in the book, but, but he's an increasing player. Um, regional developments have kind of saw there's been further delays in oil. China started asking for you know some of these loans to be repaid before Uganda has the oil money causing problems. And Standard Gorge Railway is really becoming a bit of a white, just it's going to probably be a big advert for bad projects uh, across China, Africa. Yeah? 
Missing Expo, did I interview enough Chinese people? Probably not, but I did interview some, and so they are their voice is present, but uh, not always easy to get the people you want to speak to. Am I biased towards Museveni and overstated his role? I guess maybe a little, but I do think he's really an interesting historical and regional figure who has been particularly influential. Um, and we know the world has changing. African voice will be needed more than ever in this changed multipolar world. And hopefully the work has shown the potential, not even though not the actualization of agency leading to transformation. And I leave it up to you whether this is pessimistic or optimistic about the future. Thank you. very much for that uh, Barney, Dr. Wall. I think that was absolutely brilliant and very much looking forward to uh, responses from Dr. Lydia Moy. Over to you, Lillian. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. Okay. I'm hearing I'm myself. Hearing. <laughs> but that's okay, I guess. We can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, so um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the, the invitation. We've been talking about this for a while and it turned out that we managed to do it finally on my birthday. So oh, I, am, I am so pleased to spend my birthday with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me for my age, <laughs> I won't tell you. Uh, but no, thank you so much. And, um, you know, how could I have said no? Uh, you know, Bernie, in a sense, has succeeded where even my kids have failed. Uh, and that is in making me read uh, an academic book. Uh, this is the first book that I've read since taking a break from academia in April 2021. Uh, and in part, I said yes after reading just the first line, <laughs> the first line, and I said it in an, e in an email uh, to Bernie and the team. I said, you know, I got sold uh, just at the first line, which says this is a story of African agents in the modern world. And uh, Bani defines agency here as the capacity to act or exert power. Indeed, as he puts it nicely, uh, this is a story of an African president, President Museveni of Uganda, who has, who has acted and exerted power against his regional rivals, great power partners, and emerging global actors with impressive, unexpected, and unexpected uh, consistency. Uh, I quoted Bani here. Uh, so I couldn't resist, uh, you know, the temptation of reading to 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 read this story of uh, African agency and you get an agency within China Africa relations, a, a, a topic that I am, you know, uh, passionate about. So how does this agency manifest itself or what attests to this agency? Bernie has uh, a ton of uh, anecdotes, stories, uh, short stories and examples to illustrate that. But there are just a few, uh, you know, sentences that I think help capture uh, uh, the, 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 the imagination of the reader. And here we have, for example, uh, Museveni now successfully utilizes Chinese engagement to return his primary goal, uh, the maintenance of his power and position in Uganda. Towards that end, he has also seen regional integration and regional intervention as imperative, an effort in which China has now inevitably played a role. Uh, elsewhere, I think, uh, in page 37 and 41, we read that Chinese presence helps shape the global structural environment in which Museveni's, Museveni must operate, but it also impacts tangibly at the local level, whereby any kind of economic development is beneficial to Museveni returning credibility with domestic citizens and money for patronage networks keeps on, on board key players in the political economy. Bernie said it towards the end of his presentation, we sense a little bias, or I would say a sense of admiration <laughs> for Museveni, but not Museveni the man, but rather at the ways uh, in which he has instrumentalized relationships, uh, relations with China. So at some point, uh, we read that a uh, Ugandan agency is an outstanding example of African agency. Elsewhere, we read that Museveni is a staunch pragmatist uh, rather than 
any kind of ideologue. Uh, an approach defined mainly by his bush war origins, uh, which were always far more influential on shaping ideas, interests and actions than any Western economic doctrine or Pan-African agenda. This is on page 30. But the more I read about the story of Museveni's agency, the more it takes me back to the story of Angolan agency, which is a, a country that Bernie uh, cites quite a lot. So let's take the, 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 you know, the point about pragmatism. For example, uh, Asi Malakias, uh, one Angolan expert, uh, put it best when he wrote in 2007 that Angola's behavior at the regional and international levels reflects both the pragmatism Pragmatism that has enabled the governing ruling party to survive the major historical challenges that he faced and the strategic dissonance between the Angolan government and the West. This pragmatism, he continues, has been the hallmark of the regime at the domestic level, and it continues to guide Angola's engagement, both regionally and internationally, as well as, uh, you know, to employ with, uh, as and is uh, employed rather with considerable success, as evidenced by the inclination to explore and embrace various political and economic models regardless of the origin, in the search for one that best suits Angola's unique circumstance with the ultimate goal of achieving both stability and development. And indeed, when you read the story of Uganda uh, and the story of Museveni and his agency, you see uh, similarities insofar as the pragmatism in is concerned and insofar as the ways and perhaps some of the methods that have been used to uh, you know, instrumentalize China for bigger purpose, stability, development, and uh, regional power, or regional positioning, uh, if we may uh, use that term uh, rather. So um, one thing that uh, Eke just point out, pointed out at the start of the, the seminar is uh, some of the contributions that the book made. Uh, for me, one of the utmost contributions is in its analysis of China-Africa relations. So when we talk about China-Africa relations, there is sometimes a tendency to think of each side as being homogeneous. So we sometimes refer to the Chinese government interaction with the, with the African state. Here we have the Ugandan state. Uh, so we don't often think or integrate into our analysis, you know, the complex mix and diversity or cacophony of actors, you know, who play a role in shaping, you know, this uh, Chinese engagement with Africa or with African states and actors. But here, uh, Bernie uh, set, uh, set out to show how China's engagement with Uganda interacts with the different arms of government, the state, the party, society significantly, either directly or indirectly. And he did it brilliantly. Uh, I think he was, it was to me refreshing to see an analysis of how Chinese uh, small and medium enterprises uh, with limited knowledge of the who, what and how in Uganda engage the Ugandan system of local fixers in being required to help package deal. I also very much enjoyed reading about exchanges between the Communist Party of China and Uganda's ruling party, the National Resistance Movement, and on, on the one hand, and between the Communist Party of China and a ruling party MPs, young and old. I also saw examples of China, the state's engagement with Uganda People's Defense Forces, which incidentally also sees itself as an East African force, and uh, seeing how some local kingdoms, you know, are actively uh, courting Chinese investment and even signing a memorandum of understandings with Chinese companies uh, at the same time, of course, while there are some locals uh, who are vehemently uh, resisting Chinese presence uh, in the country. So I would like to return to an example that Bernie gave, gave uh, earlier in his presentation, for example, an example that I found fascinating and quite interesting. And that's the relationship between uh, China, the China uh, Chinese party uh, and uh, a Ugandan MP of, from the ruling party, who incidentally are taxed to, to vet and approve China's large scale investments. And some of whom are, you know, are trying to instrumentalize also relations with China for re-election purposes. 
and sometimes unsuccessfully. So the example that Bani gave earlier is the example of the Chinese firm uh, you know, that was trying to buy off MPs debt and allow them to pay back at a lower rate. This move, as Bernie said, was blocked uh, by Museveni, but Bernie did not give the motivation uh, earlier. I, I found it fascinating and he writes here that uh, Museveni blocked the move as, and I quote, because he became wary of China gaining too many avenues of influence into political power centers. MP should be in debt to the NR, uh, NRM, so the, national, the, the ruling party, not to China. And that is in page 51. Uh, so I think this is a fascinating example of even conflict that is between these different layers, uh, between the different stakeholders and dif between different layers. And I think this complexity of China's uh, engagement with Africa comes out perfectly in the, in the book. Of course, there, there are limits uh, and risks to everything. Um, and here I would like to perhaps draw attention to the risk of the that the risk that come with the personalization of politics. Uh, we often, you know, talk about the fact that the leader is really seen as, you know, the savior in court. Uh, here in the book, Bernie talks about the personality and the presence of Museveni being central, uh, or centrally important to Uganda's domestic politics and international relations. That's on the one hand. And at the regional or sub-regional level, he refers to the personal role uh, that Museveni has played uh, in reviving uh, the East African community integration, you know, citing, for example, the inclusion or, or, or rather crediting Museveni for the inclusion of Rwanda, Burundi and South Sudan in the East African uh, community, uh, community. And, you know, as some of his interlocutors said, you know, Museveni is really presented as the man who keeps the possibility of federation of the EAC uh, agenda alive. So this is all good, uh, but I would hate to state the obvious, uh, but the fact is we do not expect any of Africa's most durable rulers to rule forever. So the question I had for Bernie, uh, and essentially closing where he closed as well, is in a country that where there, there appear to be so many moving parts and where those who dare to present themselves as successors are moved out of the picture, how do you see the departure or passing of Museveni influencing the structure of Uganda's complex and changing political economy on the one hand? And how do you see the country's relations with the largest trading partner, uh, uh, China, evolving uh, in the post Museveni world? So in a sense, uh, in other words, if you like, what might China-Uganda relations uh, and China's relations with the EAC look like in a post Museveni world? So I will stop with this question and uh, many, many, many congratulations Bernie, for, for, what, for a wonderful book. And thank you for, for taking us with you as you interview all these different uh, stakeholders uh, and uh, you, you take us through the process of research uh, and the journey. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you also for, for um, you know, including me in this conversation. Work. I think I was taken with what sounded to me like uh, Museveni's dead diplomacy and China's dead diplomacy as well, in terms of the MPs uh, and that conversation about the Chinese bank uh, purchasing it. But please, I think, you know, Lillian choosing to spend her birthday here with us, really, she, and she can't even share refreshments with us. Please, if we can give her another round of applause. Do you want to respond? That's a, that's a big, hard-hitting uh, question. Yes. Um, before that final tricky question, a couple of things. Yeah, do I have admiration for Ms. Evany? Uh, I, I, I have my own moral ethical views on Ms. Evany, okay? But I keep them to myself. Grudging admiration, though, I mean, you have to doff your hat in a way from a, you know, from a clinical, analytical perspective. He's played the game across historical eras very, very well. Played the West 
you know, post Cold War world. I forgot to say September 11, 12, he was publicly stating, ah, yes, we have terrorists in Uganda. You can talk to about terrorists. World resistance. They used to be called bandits and criminals. And he was disparaging them. From September 12th, there were terrorists. Immediately. Okay? And you've got a lot of political, and they're on that CIA list now and all that kind of stuff. So he's played these, and now the rising China era, he's played them very well. You have to, you have to dock your cap if you want to. Yeah? Um, Angola, yes, I, I mentioned Angola in the book, and they're actually also, um, even within the oil sector, actually, again, leave your view of the regime and corruption, whatever, to one side. But the oil, so the Sonegal Oil Company gets good deals. With their, the contracts are good. Lots of money stays in the country. And taken by the leaders elsewhere, fine. But in terms of an example of what could be achieved, and at one point, they even said to the Chinese com Chinese companies left and wrote a brief that they Senegal said, we're not, we're not, they're not going to work with Senegal anymore because they, they take too much of the contract. And then the Chinese company came back. They stood firm and said, fine. Yeah, so Angola is an interesting example. Again, uh, yes, no, I put no, yes, I tried to unpack the Ugandan state. Of course, an entire other book is on the Chinese side. Unpacking the China, we think of China. But there's the political level, there's the state owned oil companies, private businesses, medium sized companies. You know, I mention them in the book, but it's incredibly complex. And I think in the West, especially, and I think probably in Africa as well, there's an idea of China being labeled. But the West is similar. We talk about the West, but that's governments, that's businesses, that's Hollywood. There's all these different avenues of influence. You know? China has a similar in terms of talking about China. What's going to happen after the 70s? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, now, but okay, when I was writing this book, I would have predicted um, the next person will be NRM, who's part of the ruling party, and you have to have backing by the army. Uganda, the next president, has to be backed by the army in some way. If they're not, there might be trouble. Okay. Bobby Wine, who, do people know Bobby Wine? He's got a bit of international publicity recently, but he's going to, he, I, I, he's not going to win the next election. I will tell you that now. Okay. But I know he's trying to make friends in the army and that kind of thing. And it's increasingly looking like it's going to be in the 70s start. When I was writing this book, or the read the period, that's when it for the first became a rumor that Museveni was grooming his son. And Museveni's old allies were pissed off about it. Okay, the people who fought with Museveni in the bush didn't like it. One of them resigned. He was in London. I was trying to meet him when I was doing my research. He fled to London, came to Sejusa. Some of the old boys got sacked because they clearly weren't happy about it. But Museveni's kind of ridden that out. Seducers, I think, back in the government. Umber Babsi, who was sacked, he sacked in my book, he's come back. They all come back, eh? Lots of these people come back. They even spend time in prison and then come back into them because it's the only game in town. And it's probably going to be his son, it looks like. And that, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily predict his son. I would have predicted post Museveni it's going to be an army backed NRM person. Maybe the next person could be, you know, the democratic spaces opened up or whatever. It's, it's hard to predict, but that would be my prediction. What's going to happen um, almost as long as the army backs him, I think it will be relatively peaceful. Okay, I don't think there's going to be a big civil war in Uganda, that would be my prediction. Um, China relationship, it'll, China seems to ride these apparently complex regime changes pretty well actually. Sudan and South Sudan, it's done pretty well kind of being neutral, even though it's given, you know, the, um, and that kind of thing. So I, don't, I think China will be the, the, the most, the more important relationship there is the debt. Chinese, this was, there was a perception of this limitless free money that China seemed to be pumping in. And China started saying, and China never said that. 
But they started saying, well, we're not just going to give you billions forever. And you do know you're going to pay it back. And they're starting to pay having to pay it back. And Uganda does have debt level issues now. Because the oil is not still not flowing. Okay, and the debt needs to be paid back. More interesting is the East African community. I think actually, yeah, whether the next guy will be so Uganda intervenes in different places, right? Somalia, South Sudan, a troops in Central African Republic. So that might change. Because clearly that's in the 70s ideology. Um, but also, I, I think this, the longer the 70s change, he's become a burden to EAC integration. Ultimately, the EAC, the constitution is that they will be politically federated. Have a united, they're meant to eventually be the United States of the East African community. I don't think that will happen until the 70s gone because the other leaders have become so wary of him <coughs> being the king of East Africa. So I think he's become, so that might be potentially interesting and progressive actually. Um, the, the, the East African Federation can actually move in the political federation, might even become the first. But yeah, ultimately, I don't know, he's not that old. He's not the Guardian. Yet. I think he's 75 or 80 now, so he's he's old, but he's old, like, you know, so I don't he, he might be around for another election. <laughs> or, but then probably the next one, maybe his son. I guess you can Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. Thank, Thank you very you much. And happy birthday. I had no idea it was your birthday. You would have done it on a different day. If you'd done that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, we've come to an even more. I already see a hand. I don't know if that was a hand. I, I, yeah, I had some, oh, I had some chair questions, but I think I don't even uh, bother with those. If I have time, I'll come back to them later. Funny, look what you, look what you've done. Okay, excellent. Let me go. Take, I see, maybe not for one round. Okay, I see four. We'll take those four, come to you, and go back for a new set. I see Dr. Silva. And the strange. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Miranda here. So let's go in that order. Did I miss you? Okay, let's take, we'll take, so can you take five? You can. <clears throat> okay, so that, come here. Other girl, we'll come to you and then we'll continue. Okay. Can I stand with you? Uh, stand by and shout for the online people. There's yes. microphones in the front. You may be in one of the people. Okay, thank you for the one I think I've had a lot of work for six, seven, one. And uh, just to pick up on what Lilian said, in terms of the future of the relationship, because from the way it looks, from your presentation, it's seventy personalized your And if you compare, I mean, I don't know why you went to Paris or Angola, but if you look at Zambia and Tanzania, they've had a longer history in China relations that's compared to that. And Uganda's young population, a majority of them actually do not have any memory of China relations. And if you do a, if you do a survey, and I was doing one day to research, you could tell. Their interaction with China is very limited. So, in the foreseeable future, are we gonna see a moment that would be so in Zambia where the people's attitudes change? Because in such a project, you're not carrying the citizen to with you. It's your own narrow-minded, selfish interest idea. So, do you foresee a scenario where when this young rest of the population, the Kobe wine, the bone free food, they don't have any linkage. China never helped them in their own liberation. Do you foresee a scenario where the Ugandan population might reject this China agency within Uganda and see a classic scene? Because already we already started seeing pockets of protest like happened in 2016. You go to Kenya, there's also the same anti Chinese sentiments going around there. You foresee such in Uganda or classic case of a basket case in Kenya. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting presentation. I have made two 
questions if I may. So the first one is, I kind of had a different understanding of the story of the SGR, how it gets to Uganda, right? Because I was under the understanding that actually Uganda wanted the money and didn't get it from China. Uh, and in fact, I think now they're getting money from Spain because it's like Spanish policy back to at least some sections of the SGR around the So this story that you say that, you know, Museveni kind of played you know, the two sides was interesting and I wanted to know if you had more. And then the second thing is, you made a very interesting point that Museveni sort of um, let some MPs rise a little bit, but not too much, and when they rise too much, you kind of you know, crush them. I understand the, the rationale domestically. But you then also say he does similar things within the region, where he kind of you know, plays Kenya and Tanzania and others. And there I don't see the rationale so much. Like, why does he do that? Because there's a clear hierarchy. I mean, it's clear that you know, Kenya is the best. <coughs> What does he gain by doing that? Thank you very much. You got that? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I speak from. Uh, if, if we just have agency, I kind of have a vision. I'm wondering if the Buddha have any other priorities that that thing about so, the agency and the priorities, the one that I'm going to say to them. Okay. Okay. And also, another question is I'm comparing the people. If you have a sign, the way that you have to sign the capacity for negotiation was so limited that by now, we have to go the things that are going to sign. Requires another sub to be very effective. All the engineers have to come from China and help the land is very hard to come from there. It's very difficult for that this is the sector. So, we can do it. So, I'm going to ask you this. If I'm going to ask you this, if I'm going to ask you this, my question is if an agency of intercountry is based on the man the man who is the leader, is that do we see that as something good for us? I was just wondering if we are admiring Museveni's um, ability to exert Uganda's agency in China, how transferable that is to regional agency and African agency, because I mean China's influence all over Africa, especially with projects like the Belt and Road Initiative, which is very country focused but also very regional specific and then also included in something like the African Union agenda which talks about sustainable development and that kind of partnership. So is it something that's a sustainable model of exerting agency for all African voices or was it only successful in Uganda? Thank you very much. Hi, so first of all, wonderful presentation, Barney. And I think my question is really because when you were talking, and I think at one point you mentioned development and security, and it actually did make me think so much of the development model, which has been exported or imposed, I think might be a more accurate word, by the West, is based on a combination of neoliberal economics and a democratic framework. And from what we know from China, I think you even mentioned these are state led or state owned companies. And I think even The Economist has mentioned how China uses state capitalism or it's a very state-led development model. And I think my question is, has that led to maybe any conversations within Uganda about how to have the best governance model, how to have the best development model? Thank you very much for that. I think you have all those. Yes. Barney, Lydia, <laughs> if you do, you know, we'll hear from Barney, but if you wanted to Make any comments around that because you know you you are referring to next year and this as well. Please uh, feel free to do so. Very uh, good question. Then. My goodness. Uh, well, Kirsten, that's a good question. Yes. Um, in the book, I talk more about the history that different countries have, and you were right. Some like Tanzania is really in the public con the historical role China's played in the public consciousness, and the role Tanzania played. In getting Beijing onto the UN Security Council, by the way, Tanzania and Africa were crucial to China 
Beijing taking its place <coughs> rather than Taiwan in the 70s. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, uh, a good point. Yeah, I, to be honest, I, the, I took that as a leadership question. If there's an anti Chinese sentiment, is a political force. If it's, whip, if it's harnessed and whipped up, it could be. Okay. I was joining the interview, you know, Besiji, uh, he was the main opposition guy. I interviewed him and I said, why don't you tap into this anti China stuff? And he said, uh, you know, part of, you know they, they, hadn't, they didn't really see it as a mobilizing issue. Okay. Now, if it become maybe Bobby Wine, you know, for good or bad, if you want to play a populist game, that I could, you could potentially whip that up. Now, like I said, is that good or bad? You know, kind of anti-Chinese, anti-immigrant thing. It's potentially problematic. I think it's there's an underground. It's like, yeah, it, it, who do you get annoyed with? China has is going to um, Uganda has serious debt problems. Is that the Ugandan leadership fault, or is that the Chinese for lending them the money? Yeah, where's the blame? You could see how a particular leader with a particular narrative or view, you could shift that either way. Um, yeah, so that's what I would see with that. But it's it, your point about how you get, and the Ugandan um, population, even by African standard, is very young. I think it's half the country. It's really, like, really young. So we, yeah, Bobby Ryan's not going to win the next election, but it's been patient, maybe. But I think that would have to be whipped up in some way, yeah? Linda, yes, you asked clever questions, because you know about it. And it was partly, so her question, I kind of present on the 70, said he wasn't going to build SGR and that kind of thing and embarrassed the guru. But yeah, the, I say in the book, and I, it was partly in my presentation thing if I overstated stuff, that it's not the only factor. He's not just playing political games. They were funding queries and how the Uganda leg, uh, et cetera, that's true. But they were, Uganda, even before that was public, was playing and that they were publicly Stating, ah, we're not so sure anymore. Actually, can we? we might build to South Sudan. I think that's more important. So they they kind of packaged it and presented it in a way that actually it was more their choice. Okay, and those conversations were going on simultaneously with the pipeline conversation. Where, and that was a big, where is Uganda going to choose to build a pipeline? Okay, and and he he played Kenya and Tanzania quite well. Again, even there, that oil companies were influencing that space as well. Okay. And Total, the French oil company, was particularly invested, and it, it, it had its preferences. That's all part of it. That's what I'm saying about it's limited. I don't want to overstate how powerful he is. Um, does, that make, does that make sense? But I'm aware of that, you know, that the, the domestic political economy and financial issues. Um, uh, and MPD, yeah, what's the point? And of course, um, what's the point of playing regional powers against each other? I just, be, I just think it's a prestige and status and importance thing. You say Kenya is obviously more power, more rich and more powerful, but he has had big influence in Kenya. Don't forget, when in 2007 and 8, um, with the election between Kibaki and the other guy who always loses. He was about, Kibaki was about to be declared the loser. He went and had a meeting with Museveni, came back and said, no, I've won the election. Okay. <coughs> so they had some kind of conversation. And he came back and said, actually, I've won the election. And there was a, you know, there was violent conflict. There was massive contestation. But they had a person, he's influenced that Kenyan state. Uhuru, during this whole era, it was when he was being indicted by the ICC. Then Museveni acted very much as a father figure to him and was also speaking out against that ICC indictment, blah, 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 blah. So he knows, yes, Kenya is more important, but he's punched above his weight in terms of influencing that space. Uh, and even Tanzania, but in particular, I, I really think he has. Yeah. Um, uh, not yet. Um, you guys, don't people know the man, Uganda's landlocked. Okay, so the law has to have relations with Kenya and Tanzania are crucial. Okay, and, and he somehow retained influence. Aligar, that's a good question. Um, is if, if 
First of all, ultimately, the seven is prime goal has to be as stated power. I completely believe that. Okay, and that ultimately has prevented things about maybe you know would East Africa be more politically integrated if he retired and maybe his dream of the United States of East Africa could have been realised, but of course he does because of happens. Okay, so I believe that. I in the book certainly, and I I think it is still agency. I mean, I don't that's I don't know if that's a theoretical or conceptual discussion, but you can assert agency and not necessarily have a transformative, <coughs> morally well guided uh, agenda. I think I maybe I'm misworded using the word. Or, I mean, it's a shame, but I still think you can be influential and powerful even if you've got selfish interests. Um, and yes, Melek's example, yeah, is the project in Ethiopia really sustainable? Is the personalized relationship sustainable? I agree, no, that is problematic. And you, there are, there are these moments, leadership and leaders, there's these moments of opportunity to have transformative change. And of course, individuals shape particular relationships. You know, if you want it sustainable, you have to, it has to be institutionalized a lot beyond just the individual person. For sure, uh, and even if you're less democratically minded, who's your successor going to be? And you know, that kind of stuff has to come into it. It's problematic. I think this personalized relationship it's, it can be useful, but that's the starting point. You, know, you do need it to be more sustainable because you're going to die, or you're going to lose an election, or whatever. But you know, you're not going to be there forever. Uh, Shreya, how transferable is this African agency to regional and continental level? That's a big question. That's the big problem, I would say, the big African challenge, uh, is that the potential is there. I, I, may, I have a line in the book, actually, that I think I changed it. The power of the 70, the individual agency, the, uh, Angola, there are various case studies you can do. To show that as a, as a matter of political will, Africa can be influenced, can assert agency. But there's lack of political will to do it regionally and certainly continentally. But yes, if the East African community had a collective position on Chinese investments or you know resource pricing, that would be potentially very interesting. If the African Union did that. That's potentially very interesting, and I wish I, I, hope, I wish that would happen because an African, you know, Uganda is only going to be so powerful. So powerful. The East Africa community, which now includes South Sudan and possibly the Congo, that's a big power block potentially if they got that it's a classic political issue. Yeah. Um, Gloriana. Yes, development model, the, yes, this is um, Western approach has been, if you're democratic, development will come. China is explicit and you're capitalist and free market. If you're democratic and have a free market, development will come. Empirically, that hasn't worked. Historically or in Africa and the contemporary era. So yeah, China is unashamedly known as economic development is what people care about. That's the most important thing. You know, the development, peace and stability will come. Clearly, the Chinese one-party state model is appealing to the national resistance movement in Uganda. Um, the history there is the NRM movement, it's the national resistance movement. They initially, when they took power, they said, we're not going to have political parties. No party movement, we're not going to have political parties, which could, be, could have been quite interesting. Yes, an African form of democracy. And there's political parties, they just cause trouble. Okay. And we're only going to be president for two terms. Okay. In 2006, when the 70 won two elections, they had a referendum on do you want to have political parties now? Okay. And at the same time, do you also mind if I change the constitution to two terms? So, the, so that, and they, and they voted yes. So now they have, and you know, became a political party. But then the constitution, and he's changed it again because there was an age limit on the constitution, and he's changed that again. It's become that sort of, but yes, it is a thing. 
the other the development model is the thing I think a concern I had and still have is that during this era there was this big infrastructure, this idea that you build the infrastructure and development will come. Build the roads, build the rails, investment will come, the business will come, development will come. And that's and because that's what China needs. Okay. That's not really what China is. The Chinese model is simultaneously based on agricultural development. Most people in Uganda are small um, holder, you know, peasant agriculturalists. Okay? They need money. Otherwise, the roads are just being built for money. No one's going to have any money to buy any of the goods that are going to be transported. Okay? So I think there was too much focus just on infrastructure, too much investment, and that balance wasn't quite right. And I don't have <coughs> a misunderstanding of how China had done it. Also. Yes. Yes, we have two. So thank you, Riley. And let me ask, do you have any additional comments tonight? Uh, yes, if I may, and, and I'm sorry for those waiting online. Uh, just very quickly, uh, I think the key the key point that Bunny made earlier is that agency is time dependent. Uh, so it doesn't happen on its own. The key thing is, you know, the global as well as domestic political and economic conditions have to be right for a leader to be able to exercise, you know, that agency to the extent to, you know, to the extent that it can be successful. Uh, so yes, you know, the, the analysis that, you know, uh, Bernie's, uh, Bernie took us through was at a time when there was this oil boom. So at the end, there was this narrative about Africa rising. And it again takes me to Angola, where, you know, this was also the time when, you know, Angolan economies was rising. And then you had a leader who had been there, who was able to successfully you know, navigate, uh, you know, his way around Western conditionalities, preferring China. But Angola, Angola's needs were different at the time. There was the need for reconstruction. And China provided that, uh, uh, the loans, you know, without the same conditions around good governance, transparency, anti-corruption, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is the first point that I want us to be cognizant of. You know, agency is very much time dependent, and it is uh, dependent on, you know, the context. So context matters. The second point that I want to quickly um, perhaps add to, to what Bani said earlier, is uh, to the question, it responds somewhat to the question of where does change happen or where can change happen? I think the book makes it clear that uh, in this context where there are one state, one party state, uh, you know, it is most likely first and foremost to come from within the ruling party. So Bernie has example of uh, rebel MPs, you know, within the ruling parties, that, you know, who attempt to hold some government officials and Museveni himself to account. He also gives the example of the judiciary. So some judges, uh, you know, trying to say no to some decisions, but not necessarily to, uh, you know, they cannot change the expected expected by Museveni and his clan, expected outcomes of election, but they have some leeway, you know, in some respect. So change can certainly happen, I think, within from within the ruling party, but do not underestimate the power of the youth. And we say Uganda, you know, the majority is the young people. Yes, they are protesting and the protests are met with a, a severe crackdown. We have excessive use of force and so on. But still, even in a state uh, such as, uh, you know, Uganda, where you have one party state where Museveni is dominant, he controls everything. At some point, the realization comes that we cannot make any progress. We cannot move forward with, without at least trying to deliver somewhat, not just for the few, but for the majority. So the realization will come, but the youth will make these things or some of these things happen. To what extent, we do not know, but I suspect that with time, change uh, will come. So that's what I wanted to add very quickly to uh, the answers that Bani gave earlier. Thank you so much for that, uh, Lillian. Um, I see Daniel hands off um, online, and I'm sorry, I think Joel has dropped off, so I'm very sorry uh, to see that. Um, but Daniel, perhaps we hear from you, and then I come into the room uh, to take some, I know there was one hand raised. Oh, you were telling me that, thank you very much. Um, so, thank you. Daniel, please. 
Oh, thank you very much. Just um, one comment and uh, two quick questions. Um, my comment is, I hope Barney's feeling less nervous than he did when he sent me a message the other day about all this. <laughs> um, and, and I hope you now believe with all the evidence around you that actually your book's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, Picking up actually on Lillian and then other questions, my first question is relates to how you said that he has agency, um, which is admirable in many ways, but he still maintains agency over a population to whom he's delivered very little um, in terms of the lack of transformation. I, I'm not sure it's the lack of a vision. I mean, Uganda produces documentation, as do many countries, about vision 2050 and, and and so on and so forth and i i, I just I, i'm interested in that and i think that, that relates to lillian's point about time dynamics and, and and so on in terms of the time hasn't come the penny hasn't dropped so to say with the youth it will um and it'll be interesting to see what the ugandans think of him and how they react to his departure and what they want as opposed to what he's trying to groom at the moment. Um, so that will be an interesting kind of dynamic um, in terms of a break in the lineage, so to say. But I've just finished a job for the Africa Europe Foundation on following up from the February 22 summit where they made commitments to each other and wanted a partnership of equals. So my question is, the evidence strongly suggests that Africa has no agency at all when it comes to these agreements and, and kind of partnerships. Well, I won't call them partnerships. It's a relationship um, between the African Union and the European Union. That is despite having signed off Agenda 2063 nearly 10 years ago, which defines the quote, what Africa wants, yet it's not tabled at all it's not articulated it still looks like a kind of aid donor recipient relationship in terms of commitments the eu embarrassed itself with uganda in september 22 with the moratorium on the oil and then it had the gall to then try and play catch up with the belt and road initiative from china called the global gateway which basically is what china wants but with a lot of hooks and and Africa is just looking at this, arms folded with complete indifference. And it completely, it completely confuses me, if, 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 you, if you see what I mean, because I know that, you know, many, many African countries are really proud of themselves and so on, but, and they have so much to offer, and we all know that. But when it comes to the crunch, they just seem to power i know in private they're becoming a lot more and kind of animated and, and frustrated and as you said pissed off with the west because of this kind of condescending attitude from from europeans and and from others but i i i don't understand why the kind of nationalist kind of agency and rhetoric of wanting to be ambitious in a political sense you know, with China doesn't manifest itself on the on the global table. Is this simply because the AU is just completely incompetent and is bankrolled by the G7? Is that is that their their investment budget and their recurrent budget? I mean, I think member states only account for thirteen percent of the total expenditure per per annum. What what's going on? What's going on there? So two questions. One is the future in terms of do you see a window based on Lillian's points about the youth especially rising up and 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 seeing a time when he goes and, and suddenly penny dropping off you know this is all security with no transformation and what's in it for us type thing in terms of a political issue and and the lack of security over the hold he has on on the kind of political shape of things in Uganda on the one hand and on the other what a great performance by him in, in, in terms of the issue of the regional integration and his vision and how that's just not replicating itself on a continental level, let alone a regional level, when it comes to negotiating with the Europeans. Okay. Even simple things like, let's get rid of the EPAs. They're a complete contradiction to the African continental free trade area, you know, which is one of the pilots, right? For, for for Agenda 2063. So I'm a bit confused. 
Thank, thank you. Very, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those really important points, Daniel. Uh, Lillian, were you? Are you going to respond, or are you putting a, a question on the table? Uh, no, to respond, but after Bani, if that's okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I should. Let's see. We should no, take no, others. Okay, Bani, yeah, let me see. Let me see if we should take others and we come to responses from both. Okay. Okay. Right. In the room, I saw Zenye. Um, okay. 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 Thank you so much. I have three. Yeah. And then we'll come back to the both of you. Yeah, my question was, um, so sort of in the context of the increase in, uh, in African um, <coughs> given the context of the, the rise in crews uh, in Israel and uh, West Africa, uh, so there's sort of a trend of the practical countries, but um, in Uganda, it does not have a problem to get more stable. We have an example of a couple of missions to get more stable who have that. Thank you very much. Museveni hasn't transformed Uganda. He made for at least two decades he made big political capital because it was secure. Yeah. The older people in the rural villages remember all the conflicts, they remember the civil wars, and he played it and and it was true, it, it was stable Uganda. And he made big political capital of that. That's now fading because the young people who never don't remember the wars. I've only grown up with this um, Yes, they, 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 they will. I mean, they will pick up increasingly disgruntled. Uh, it's slightly related countries. I mean, because of the political economy of Uganda, where you have to allow the big people in your government to, you know, take certain bribes. If the UPDF go, the army goes to particular places. You kind of have to allow generals to kind of loot a little bit because that's how you keep everyone on board. And it, that has that's become too much. It's just become more and more corrupt, and that has he's never been able to balance it right to to, to get genuine economic transformation. 
in the way you can at least argue someone like Kagami is somehow succeeding. I don't want to get into the controversy around that, but you can at least, Uganda is not spoken about in that way, uh, in the way Rwanda is, for example. Um, I don't know why the African Union doesn't fight and tell the EU to shove it and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I've never said the African Union in particular, and Africans in the room will have far more interesting things to say. Uh, is there an element to it? Are we a bit too ambitious? I mean, the African Union, 54 countries working together for united positions. On, I mean, no other region in the world is like that. Yeah, we see the EU is the best example. We've seen the increasing problems with that, and it became, did it become too big, the EU? And Eastern Europe came in, and that really made it a bit more complex, and now you know, every anti-immigration is on the up, but all that kind of put those problems. So is it just partly inevitable that it's very difficult for leaders to unite on particular positions? And yes, the EU does pay the bills. And all this Chinese investment in Africa, there's still more Western money than Chinese, generally, in Africa. Okay? It's still just generally, even during COVID, all the masks that China was sending got a lot more publicity. But Europe has been giving a lot more financial money than China. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. When it comes to the crux, do they just, you know, they can't go through with it and they don't trust the other guy to share their position? I, you know, I don't know. Because we always, most Africans or Africanists want that, but it doesn't seem to happen. Um, would there be a queue in Coup Uganda? I'll be bold because they'll probably maybe there'll be a queue to coup tomorrow. He seems to have done pretty well. I mean, in the literature, they talk about him coup proofing his regime. The disgruntled people who seems to smell out fairly quickly and they go in exile a few years and then come back saying, sorry, and I'll come back. Um, I would be surprised. I mean, they went to, um, I would be surprised, okay? Because I think I'd also be surprised because he knows he has to keep them on board and therefore does. Do you know what I mean? I don't think he allows pockets of rebel generals to emerge, uh, from my reading, okay? Um, I think that's very unlikely. Um, UK, again, yes, I think Uganda is envious of the Chinese model, this one-party state development model. I spoke to plenty of people who said, ah, oh, we should have never let this multi-party politics thing, it's caused all the problem, we should have kept the no-party state, um, which at least theoretically might have been interesting. Of course, it became a one-party state, and of course, it was a party, etc., but it was at least an interesting idea. Um, so they're clearly envious of that, um, but it's they, the capacity of the state is so much more limited So in Uganda. So even if you have one strong party, they just the developmental aspect of it has just not happened. Um, but certainly the idea of having a one strong party is appealing, uh, I would say, yes. Um, and all my, my reading, I did make, there's an idea that China supports um, dictators in Africa. Okay, actually, China will deal with anyone, whether you're democratic or dictator or whatever. But their presence has genuinely aided in the setting. Okay, genuinely, I support that claim. You played the West very right here. You can make they have genuinely helped in the power. The way they've been able to play the game with them. Final question: Could the East African community, where, where are you from? Maybe I'll tell you. Uh, East Africans in the room will correct me if I'm wrong. Most East, East Africans I spoke to are not fundamentally opposed to the idea of a federated East African community. It's like, again, in Europe, people in the, the UK but elsewhere are just fundamentally were opposed to the idea of a federated Europe. Most East Africans I've spoken to are at least open to the idea. I don't think it's a stupid idea. So I think a long-term agenda, I think it is potentially possible. And yes, but some of the systems and institutions for seven years helped set up. 
even if they were for his own selfish interests, could have longer term consequences that like, could uh, lead to that longer term. The case is going to say everything you've said is wrong. <laughs> you've just done a confederation constitution. Yeah. So it's, in, it's discussed, it's not fine in the sky. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that's everyone. Thank you. Lillian, please. Uh, yes, uh, just to tell Daniel that he's, he asked the question many Africans are asking. <laughs> what is the role uh, you know, of the African Union? Why can't we have, you know, for example, a common position on China's engagement with Africa, you know, setting out what exactly it is that we as Africans, but also African leaders would like to see, you know, as part of these, uh, as part of these relations. Are common positions uh, impossible? They are possible. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2018, I think, after the declaration of the, the year 2018 as the African Year of Anti-Corruption, uh, there was some movement around stolen asset recovery. And, you know, that led to the adoption of a common position on stolen asset recovery. If today we are talking about a, a potential tax convention led by the UN, it is in part because Tabumbeki and the high level panel on illicit financial flows have led the way. Now, if follow me uh, in my analysis, what is what is the issue about? It's about money and particularly it's about the money that we can get in. We can get back to Africa. So it seems that when it doesn't involve financial interest of individual state, then there is no common position. Or if there is one, it is, you know, on paper and it is not necessarily, you know, implemented. So we don't see the fruits in practice. Uh, it is a shame, but, you know, this is a conversation uh, that, uh, you know, we are having, all of us. Uh, and it's not just the African Union, uh, it's also ECOWAS, sub, some, uh, you know, sub -reg uh, regional economic, commission, you know, community, especially with the multiple coups and uh, in particular the treatment of Niger, Burkina Faso uh, and other uh, Western states that have, um, you know, been taken hostile, if you can, you know, by, by the army. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for that comment, for that question. I think it's a brilliant one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. So we're now coming to the end of the session so we can uh, release colleagues to also get some refreshment. But I think you will agree with me that we've had a delightful evening. Please, once again, a round of applause. For us. <laughs> and of course, for our discussions as well, please. <laughs> and then for you, for having you here with us, and this brilliant Acknowledge. Um, we had uh, Professor Fumi Olanushaki, who, of course, is uh, a professor here with us at the African Leadership Center. And I'm, 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 you know, of course, she would be here. She was brand new supervisor and a professor uh, with us. Um, but is incredibly busy always, of course, because she's a uh, vice president, international engagement and service here at King. So we are super privileged to have her here with us. Let me also recognize uh, Shiva Nyoni, who is the director of the African Leadership Center in Nairobi, our sister center that's based in Nairobi. Uh, Ziza Mayam Kamanyeli, who is a long-term, very significant mentor on our uh, program. So we're fortunate you are here and so glad uh, you made it here with us. Let me recognize our fellows, our new cohort, who have been with us two, three weeks now. Uh, we have alumni in the room, well, not quite alumni, fellows who are uh, passing us in the room here uh, with us as well, and alumni as well who have come uh, to visit us uh, as well. So thank you so much for joining us here. Um, it's been really awesome to have you. Those online as well, thank you so much. I know some have popped off. It was really wonderful to have you here with us uh, today. Uh, so, Lillian, believe us when we say, really, we will enjoy refreshments on your behalf. But also <laughs> so enjoy. We'll really, really be enjoying uh, that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank with you. Uh, I'll bring us to a close um, and say, please, uh, colleagues, uh, join us, have some refreshments before 
uh, you head off and have some conversations, questions that didn't come up uh, in the session itself. I'm sure Brian will be only too happy to um, respond to those uh, later on. Lily, I will greet you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done again to Barney for a brilliant book. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, colleagues. Please join us and get some refreshments. Thank you so much.